Thanks, everyone. Um, this really is among my favorite uh, groups to speak with. I was with Summer Institute last year. And um, I was just saying on the walk over here, I would have given my eye teeth when I was like a 23, 24 year old grad student to have this kind of a community of people doing really fascinating work. So it's really a thrill uh, to, to just to be here. Um, it does come, my presence here does come with two apologies, however. Uh, the first is that because uh, so many of the people here in the room are part of this summer institute, um, this is one of the rare times in my speaking and teaching where I don't feel I have to make things accessible. I'm just going to like go for the high, you know, the, the most obscure. So I know a number of you are not part of uh, the Summer Institute. So some of the parts about, you know, Leviticus and cultic impurity <laughs> may seem a little arcane, but th there'll be jokes at the end. You just kind of go with it. <laughs> uh, but it's really a treat to be able to have this kind of high level conversation. Um, and the second apology uh, is a twofold apology. First, I'm from New York. Uh, where we talk fast. And second, um, a couple of years ago, I spent five months on a silent meditation retreat, not speaking for five months, meditating. And um, to make up for that, I speak incredibly fast. Um, but I want to save as much time as possible for Q&A and conversation. Uh, and so I am going to speak quickly and uh, talk a little bit about queer liminality, queer scholarship, and mostly living on the borderlines uh, between them. I want to ask a couple of framing questions for those of us who are here in the room who consider ourselves uh, budding queer scholars or queer activists um, and use a case study for illustrating the kind of questions that I want to ask, the, the question of liminality, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, and how that plays out in an academic context and in a political or activist context and how those things intersect uh, and draw some conclusions. So all within 30 minutes. Um, and, uh, I, and even put Ken Stone as a, as, a, uh, as a shout out right there on the outline. <laughs> All right, so here are some of the initial framing questions that I want to ask. I want to set up a couple of dichotomies. And everyone in the room who's an academic knows dichotomies, right? We hate dichotomies. They're always false. They're problematic. And if they're not already problematic, we want to problematize the dichotomies. So that being that in mind, so here's the scholar activist notion. Scholars tend toward explication, activists toward persuasion. You're, the better scholar you are, the more complex your ideas. But to be an activist, active in the political world, you need to simplify, right? As Sharon said to me earlier today over Starbucks, think in terms of bullet points. Scholars want to push the edge, right? That's where it's interesting to do interesting work that's pushing the edge. Activists tend to like to, if they're mainstream activists, to push the middle, right? Most of the time. Um, scholars tend to be, interested in ideas and have fidelity to the truth, whereas activists tend to be pragmatic. And it's not like we want to shade the truth or not tell the truth, but we do want to use the truth for a certain purpose. We're just noticing a couple. So this is just in the framing. The frame. So a second set of dichotomies. Constructivist essentialist. This should seem relatively familiar to many of you. Um, essentialism is winning the day uh, for gays and lesbians uh, and the rest of us in the United States right now, thanks uh, to Lady Gaga. Right? We know that we were born this way. We didn't choose this way. We didn't construct our identity. Our identity is not the product of shifting social constructions which change over time. No, we were born this way. Um, and there's, a, there's an essentially essentialistic argument that's constantly, constantly being made in the public. But if you're an essentialist in, the, in academics, right, you should be scorned and thrown into your essentialist corner and face the, and face the wall, right? <laughs> Nobody's an essentialist in, in academia because we understand that everything is constructed, everything is fluid, everything is complicated, right? Second possible conflict uh, set of dichotomies. Finally, <laughs> another set of dichotomies, and these may or may not overlap, right, between the radical queers and the good gays, right? Um, right now, even as I speak, exactly as I speak, I'm being paid by the good gays, and yet, uh, when, I, when I come to Nashville, not on HRC's dime, I go to Short Mountain, the Radical Fairy Sanctuary, with the other radical queers. Right? So who is Jay Michelson? Right? He actually has two Facebook IDs, three actually, but two personal Facebook pages, two different personalities. And I try to actually be on both sides of this particular dichotomy. Right? So the good gays, we love marriage. Right? We're so happy. I'm in New York. I'm getting married. It's great. I like marriage. But the radical queers, right? screw marriage. Right? That's not what we're about. We're actually about sexual liberation, not just rights and equal rights. We're actually about the grassroots and transformation of society, not just assimilation into society. Right? Three sets of dichotomies, which may or may not overlap. And this is all just the framing questions. I just want to throw a lot of this stuff out there and think about it over the next couple of minutes. So, you know, are you, which one are you? Have you thought about one is, uh, how one is often cast in the role of another? 
So by being a future professor or a, pu or, or, a, or a theologian or a member of the clergy, you might actually be cast in the role of explaining that which precisely you don't want to have to explain and oversimplify. When does your scholarly agenda have political implications? And should the latter even dictate the former? Or should we be so devoted to the truth in all of its obscurity that, that that's, what the, that's what the academy is all about, right? the city on the hill? OK, hold that thought. So here's the, um, here's the, the framing, uh, sorry, the, the kind of example that I want to talk about. Liminality, the state of in-betweenness, the state of neither this nor that. Uh, queers tend to like liminality, and we're going to talk about liminality in just a second. So here's a, here's an, a simple opening provocative question, which um, I now give hour-long talks on, which I can take out of a can, like one of those kind of snakes, you know, and just immediately talk about what's the meaning of the Levitical rules regarding sexuality, especially homosexuality, right? Levit can we chant the verse together? Leviticus 18.22. <laughs> right, over and over again. This is the whole talk uh, that I give time and time and time and time again. Uh, as an activist and now trying to, uh, to sell a book on book tour. Uh, now I'm going to give it in five minutes or less, maybe three minutes if no one interrupts. Um, there's a lot of familiar answers which we hear as to why Leviticus says what it says, right? Forget what it says, right? So uh, maybe it's about a lifestyle or it's something that homosexuality is non-procreative or it's a threat to the family, right? All these familiar answers are actually completely, oh look, but my slide disappeared. I had a joke slide right after that. Well, there was a slide after that that said, wrong, right? All of these familiar answers are actually incorrect. Uh, it's not actually the agenda of Leviticus. The agenda of Leviticus has to do with, with liminality, right? With liminality and boundaries. Um, actually, the Bible never discusses the nature of homosexuality, which isn't surprising since the term itself was invented 150 years ago. Uh, it certainly regards sexual behavior as, as about acts, not identity. Um, the text of the Hebrew Bible and all but one of the texts of the New Testament only deal with men. Um, Sodom's not about homosexuality. If we're talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, we're talking about two verses. And there is my favorite one. Um, maybe I'll even skip some of the stuff on the bottom, right? So noticing, just, just really briefly as a side note, uh, that this, may, this verse may be about violence, it may be about misogyny, it's certainly only about men and about acts, right? But the word I really want to bring out is this word toiva, right? Toiva. So what is, how's the word toiva usually translated? Abomination. Right? I don't know what homosexuality is, but I know the Bible tells me that it's an abomination. And this is what I call the myth of God versus gay. Um, and it's, you, you hear it again and again and again from both the right, the left, and the center all the time. I just read a major ne me media report a day or two ago which talked about how people are learning to square their sexual identities with the Bible's blanket prohibition on homosexuality. Right? There is definitely not a blanket prohibition on homosexuality anywhere in the Bible. There are, ver there are several verses, but there's certainly not a blanket prohibition on homosexuality. So from an activist point of view, this boring question, which as a scholar I have looked at for years and years and years and am thoroughly not interested in, <laughs> this is the question, right? This is the question. And if we're actually interested in lessening suffering in the world, this is the question that we're actually dealing with, not uh, how is the notion of gender constructed in a way that's actually related to the construction of national identity and, some, and so forth, which I'm going to talk about in two minutes. <laughs> right? Toy va is an act forbidden to one group and not another. It's really a taboo. Here are some examples of where toy, va, toy vote are found in the Hebrew Bible. It's almost always related to avodah zarah, to foreign worship, to idolatry. And most importantly, it's culturally relative. There are things which are toy va for the Egyptians, which are not toy va for the Israelites. So whereas the word abomination has a sort of ontological claim, this is something that should not exist in the world, actually toy va has no ontological claim. It's purely a legal claim. It's that this is taboo for us, right? Just as eating with <laughs> the Hebrews is toy va for the Egyptians. Okay, word toy va. So if toy va is a culturally relative taboo that's related to the boundary between Israelite and foreign, and male anal sex is specifically called a toy va. So the prohibition on male anal sex is a culturally relative taboo related to the boundary between Israelite and foreign. That's what Leviticus is about. Remember all those framing questions from before? We're going to come back to them in just a minute. Um, and noticing, too, that there's a lot of sort of supporting evidence for this. Right? This is really, it's about idolatry. It's about the boundaries between Israelite and foreign. And it reflects the boundaries of, that are also drawn throughout Leviticus that are just the same way. Right? So here's some nice statistics, right? So um, 
47 verses on clean and unclean animals, 59 verses on skin diseases, 57 more verses on the quarantine for skin diseases. All right, this is the part just, after, just around the holiness code in the book of Leviticus, which begins by precisely the introduction of Eshazara, of foreign fire. Right? And in response to that act come chapters and chapters and chapters of, of verses about distinctions, right? about not being liminal, not being in between. What's the purpose? To discern between the holy and the secular, between the impure and the pure, over and over again, kind of like a chorus. Right? There was a blending that took place between Israelite and foreign, and the response is, don't do that and a series of taboos, including this taboo on sexual behavior. Right? This is not actually about the family. Right? It's not actually about any of the sort of common things which we hear all the time. Right? Clearly, uh, the, what the text is really about is about drawing boundaries. Right? And everyone who's read Purity and Danger, this should sound very familiar. Right? We may not like dichotomies in the academy, but the Bible loves dichotomies. Right? Loves it, especially the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. Right? Between uh, tahor and tameh, pure and impure, ordered and chaotic, Israelite and foreign, etc., and male and female, and a number of other problematic dichotomies that we could add to the list. This is what God does. God divides the light from the darkness and gives laws and tells us how to order chaos in a way that makes sense. Right? And two citations to, uh, to Mary Douglas. Right? Over and over again in the dietary laws and the construction of the tabernacle, order over chaos, no liminality, you're in this box or you're in that box. And even today, I didn't eat the chicken at dinner because of these ancient cultic taboos about order and chaos. Right? So it's very much alive and well uh, for many of us. Okay, so where do, we learn, where do we learn about the meaning of sexuality and boundary? From Ken. Right? That's where we learn about right? the construction of this nation, this idea of the Canaanite and the Israelite, which are themselves constructions, which don't reflect any actual ethnic or national or these days archaeological reality. It's a construction, creates a boundary line, and it distinguishes Israel as the boundary drawer. It's a boundary about boundary. Right? We don't do what they do creates the we. Right? What separates us from them is that we make those separations clear. We are the boundary drawers, we the Israelites. We are the boundary drawers. We will not have any of that Dionysian revelry and drunken orgies and sexual prostitution that they, meaning my brother, my sister, my cousin, do. Right? We are defined in this way. Sexuality is the site where order, pure Israelite, is distinguished from chaos, impure, foreign. So parenthetically, because now we're going to come back to those framing questions, if one is involved, as I am, in a faith tradition that's an heir to this boundary drawing project, what problems does that bring up in terms of boundaries that might not actually fit our experience or that we might want actually to deliberately efface? The religion of boundary is still alive and well. Right? Here's a nice man named Louis Jacobs. Uh, in the Jewish world, he's regarded as a nice mainstream rabbi. I could have picked this quote from any number of hundreds of rabbis. The Hebrew word for holiness, kedusha, conveys the twin ideas of separation from and dedication to something. Right? Standard Judaism 101. Right? Separation. Holiness is about separation. And the drawing of boundaries around Israel and Israelites is also alive and well. This is the separation barrier not far from my university in Jerusalem. And the notion of queers and or homosexuals as boundary crossers has reappeared in three very different, very different contexts. Okay, so now we're going to fast forward from ancient biblical boundaries to right now. So first, our friends on the American New Christian Right have defined homosexuality often in terms of boundary maintenance. Right? And I'm happy to give out the slides, by the way. We can get the citations afterwards. Right? Here's militant homosexuality, which, by the way, I don't know what that is, but if any of you do, <laughs> let me know. I mean, it sounds, it sounds fun. It's fundamentally opposed <laughs> to religion, family, or anything that presupposes a natural moral order. Right? Natural moral order. Natural moral to me may be oxymoronic, but right, natural moral order, a transcendent God or something else higher than ourselves. Opposed to order very similar to opposed to order in Leviticus. 
Uh, this is what, well, this one's my almost my favorite. The fa favorite one's coming next. As man is reduced in statue, all hell will break loose, right? Sexual boundaries, civilization boundaries, right? What you do in your bedroom does matter to how society is ordered, right? Um, and it's about the ordering of masculine and feminine. As man is reduced in stature relative to whom, right? This is the best one. Uh, Paul Cameron, founder of the Family Research Council, um, untrammeled homosexuality, I did this last year too, so it's fun, can take over and destroy a social system. By the way, if anyone knows about untrammeled homosexuality, <laughs> not as good as militant, but I'll still, <laughs> if you isolate sexuality as something solely for one's own personal amusement, and all you want is the most satisfying orgasm you can get, and that is what homosexuality <laughs> seems to be, <laughs> then homosexuality seems too powerful to resist. The evidence is that men do a better job on men and women on women, <laughs> if all you're looking for is orgasm. It's pure sexuality. It's almost like pure heroin. It's such a rush. Marital sex tends toward the boring end. Generally, it doesn't deliver the kind of sheer sexual pleasure that homosexual sex does. Yeah. So I've, I've, checked with my, I've checked with my straight friends. Um, and they confirmed that homosexuality is too pow seems too powerful to resist. Uh, they, they're sorely tempted, but you know, they, they're believers, and so they stay within the lines and remain heterosexual. Um, so right, obviously, I, I just want to do this quote because it's funny. But do, but do no notice a little bit something about, something about this chaos, the potential for, the potential for disorder, right? Take over and control, uh, take over and destroy a social system. But there's not actually any discussion of how that actually happens. It's just assumed that if we allow untrammeled homosexuality, the social system which depends on the proper relationships of men and women and family and all those other things will, will be, destroyed. be destroyed. There's this power right, that's clearly, and Paul Cameron, by the way, not a marginal figure, right? Not like some wacko. Like, I mean, he may be some wacko, but not an obscure wacko, right? This is somebody whose opinions are repeated over and over again. Right? Uh, in, um, in, in debates around uh, equality. Right? So there's actually an interesting agreement. I mean, actually, maybe the new Christian right actually has Leviticus kind of right. And many queers say, you betcha. <laughs> right? This sounds great. Where do I sign up, if you're one of the radical queers, right? Where do I sign up to destroy the social system? Because I'd love to do it, right? The social system, the patriarchy, right? Racism, right? Classism, capitalism, whatever ism. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and this would be great. And many, actually, many radical queers actually do believe that the control over the body, drawing boundaries on the body, is the first place where boundaries in general are drawn and the first place where we need to erase them. As soon as we begin to divide categories, boundaries, we begin to conquer them, us, black, white, female, male, oversimplify actual experience, right? None of those, none of those dichotomies actually are reflective of reality, right? And invariably subordinate one side to the other. Every boundary line is a battle line, right? Every boundary line is a battle line. And some obligatory sites to Levy Nelson and Derrida. But Ken Wilber's line is good, right? Every boundary line is a battle line. So if we're a nation of boundary drawers, the Israelites in Leviticus, well, that suggests there might be, right? we might be drawing battle lines as well. So right, exactly the boundaries that Leviticus wants to patrol for many queer theorists, these are exactly the categories we want to take apart or problematize or at least recognize that they're there. Right? For justice reasons, not just because we're we have fidelity to the truth, but because we actually care about how these, these dichotomies allocate power. So fundamentally opposed, right? So the radical queers and the new Christian right may be kind of agreeing, just disagreeing as to whether it's a good idea to take apart these categories <laughs> or not, right? But for, but for those who see problems with the way, quote unquote, civilization is constructed, then destroying civilization might be a good thing to do. Now, really briefly, there's even a third queer agreement about the, the, the connection between liberated sexuality on the one hand and liminality and taking apart dichotomies and boundaries on the other. Right? That's the connection that so far the queer theorists, the new Christian right seem to agree that something about queerness brings about disorder. Even in a, a very different outside of the academy and outside of uh, these sort of battle lines, the quote unquote gay spirituality movement, same arguments. 
Harry Hay, the founder of the Radical Fairies and the Mattachine Society. Either or belongs to the two-dimensional world. This is the world where the hetero male assumes that either you're with me or you're against me. Either I'm king of the mountain or you are. Third gender people, right, queer people, were and are those who are assigned responsibilities for discovering, developing, and managing the frontiers between the seen and the unseen, between the known and the unknown. I mean, historically, possibly problematic, sort of a neo-romantic, quasi, not so neo-romantic view of human, but still actually for many people, a deeply affirming and nourishing uh, ideology. Uh, drawing a little bit on uh, sort of in a culturally appropriative way on the over 150 Native American traditions who had some notion of third gender, gender variant individuals given sacred roles. Which if you don't know this little slide, by the way, which I just kind of stuck in here, I didn't really even need to have it there. But if this is news, please read these books. Right? Right? It is actually separate from how this notion has been appropriated by non-Native Americans, which is very problematic. Just its existence in history, for me, actually was kind of a life changer. Like, wow, it's actually possible to see gender variant people as sacred. Right? Anyway. Um, and so, right, gay spirituality writers draw on these traditions and representations of them to, to argue for third gender spirituality today. And it's, this is a male, this is sort of a, a men's thing. Um, and uh, problematic for being so, although most of the writers who are listed here actually specifically say, I'm not going to describe women's experience as a non-woman, and that's um, not gonna, which I think is actually an interesting position to take. Okay, so let me see if I can bring some of this together. Remember the framing questions? Scholar, activist, good gay, radical queer, um, constructivist, essentialist. Okay, let's see if we can bring it, bring it to a little bit of an inconclusion. So scholarship regarding liminality, this is my assertion, if it has a contemporary normative element, aligns itself with a particular vision of queerness. Just doing your work puts you on a team, even if you don't want to be put on that team. And even if you say team, team, not team, that's a dichotomy, that doesn't exist, right? You're still, that, you're on that team. You're on the there is no team team. <laughs> So this is a little bit of a complicated story. Right? Does liberated sexuality undermine traditional values or not? Right? This is actually, this first little, first, first line, right? I was just involved in the marriage equality fight in New York. This was the question, right? Does liberated sexuality, which parenthetically I think is much more than homosexuality, I think it's actually something much more interesting than homosexuality. I think it actually includes feminism. I'm just gonna stop doing this. Right? The New Christian Right says yes, and that's terrible. Leviticus says yes, but for different reasons. Queer theorists say yes, and that's great. Third gender, I'd say yes. And the good gays, remember them? Say of course not. Of course not. Right? Same-sex marriage is just marriage. Love is what makes a family. If you support family, this is Andrew Sullivan's argument, if you support marriage, you should support gay marriage because it's more marriage. Right? The only reason, Andrew Sullivan says, and has written, the only reason that gay life is so, gay male life is so libidinous, wild, and ecstatic, which is clearly true for everyone, um, <laughs> is that we don't have the structures in place that straight society has. So if you like traditional values and you like marriage, have more of them. Right? And this is what we've, we've heard this rhetoric used over and over again, including by our shared meal ticket, right? the human rights campaign. Right? That marriage, that same-sex marriage isn't going to destroy civilization. Right? That's just homophobia. Maybe. Right? And, uh, and of course I had to put Ken in again, but I'm not really sure what he <laughs> thinks, so we'll find out later. Right? The good gays say, we won't disturb a thing. Just, this is about equality. Right? This is about family. Right? And it's no coincidence that most of the people funding and making those arguments are themselves insiders who have the money to spend right? and who tend to have a certain kind of focus on their more narrow, not necessarily a bad thing, but more narrow set of rights that they're interested in winning. Right? Whereas the queers are like, well, of course we're going to disrupt your system. Your system sucks. <laughs> right? And yes, there's something anarchic about queer sexuality. Marriage is part of the problem. The last thing we should want if we're about liberation is more marriage. So yeah, we're anti-family, right? And notice too, just at the end, if, there's, if the focus is larger, so the focus isn't just about getting rights for gay people, then the kinds of coalitions that one builds will be different also. So if this is about freedom, 
then you have to ask sort of questions about intersectionality, like, well, what are the other ways in which freedom is, uh, is restricted? What are the other opportunities that are allocated according to your membership in a group or not in a group? If the, if the question, if the way you define the question is, is broader, so the coalitions that you build or will sort of have to build um, will be broader as well. But if your focus is narrow, well, the coalitions are kind of a little optional, right? One thing I wanted to bring out with this talk, by the way, was to see both sides as kind of intellectually respectable within their own, right? So it's very fashionable to bash, right, to bash the big organizations, right? HRC, GLAD, et cetera, right? But let's see, let's understand that there is a coherence, right, to that view, right? It's not intrinsically morally bankrupt. Right, so for the good gays, we wanna, we, we're, yeah, we're upholding the Judeo-Christian, right? That's why Sharon and I have jobs, right? Because we wanna convince people that God versus gay is a myth and that you can be a good Christian or a good Jew or a good Muslim or have a, a spirituality of many different kinds of flavors and still celebrate liberated sexuality, right? And of course, we wanna condemn this rhetoric that gays are gonna be the end of civilization, right? Whereas on the queer side, we may wanna actually question the value of getting into a system which is all about, or was founded on, let's say, not all about, not all about, which was founded on a principle of boundary making and us theming. Maybe we do actually want to upset some of the binaries that precisely some of the good gays want to maintain. Right? And again, I'll just say it a second time, just repeating myself, just by doing your work, you get put on a team. So where do you fit in? Scholar, activist, both. Queer, gay, lesbian, straight, etc. Subverter, preserver, or do you think it's not my agenda? I, it's, I'm, I'm here for the truth. I am studying history. I am doing sociology. I, that it, but that does put you on a team, right? Are you a seeker of liberation or a seeker of truth or both? Do you really believe that the truth will set us free? Or if the, if the line right now, today, is actually God versus gay, if the line right now is, what does Leviticus say about the gays? Is it true that seeking truth and seeking liberation are the same? So I just want to conclude on a personal note to kind of put some of my cards on the table, and then we'll have time for discussion. Uh, and the discussion, the rules for the discussion are not that there are no rules, but that uh, anything tangentially related to something about sexuality and religion is fair game for a question. So personally, how do, I, how do I find myself negotiating this, uh, this uh, dynamic? Um, and it should be clear that there's not a conclusion, right? So I, I find the, the third gender liminal role to be really nourishing, personally. In my own queer theological work, I find it really exciting to think about um, how do queers, and so in the Jewish categories, how do queers relate to God, Torah, and Israel? That's a question that's barely been asked. We're too busy harping over freaking Leviticus, right? But enough about Leviticus. Like what's, what's unique, right? The play of life goes on and you can contribute a verse. What are the queer verses, right? Not Leviticus. Is sexuality more like eye color, which I don't think is particularly theologically significant? Or is it more like gender, which actually does have a lot of consequences for how we do theology and how we think about religion and how power is allocated, right? I think talking about religion without talking about gender is kind of morally bankrupt. I think it's ridiculous, in fact. Talking about religion without talking about eye color, well, okay. You know, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, unless eye color is a proxy for, for race or for something else, but just eye color, really, I, you know, I don't know if that's so important. So which is it? Which is, 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 which is sexuality more like? I think that's an interesting question to ask. So, and I'm nourished both by the sort of radical fairies and others who are outside of quote-unquote Judeo-Christian uh, religious systems and uh, those systems themselves. So here's the but. Right? I, I have all this both and, but I want the same privileges and same rights that all the straight people have, even if I don't believe they exist. <laughs> right? So, the simple, here's a, so marriage is a terrible, uh, heteronormative, patriarchal system, um, but give it to me if you're going to give it to somebody else. <laughs> right? So I want to recognize that religion is where a lot of the power is and critique it heavily, but when I'm in religious communities, I don't want to be seen as an outsider. Right? So I want full inclusion while I critique you. <laughs> right? I mean, you think about it, it's kind of strange, right? So I mean, a lot of the work that I do with, uh, with the organization that Rebecca mentioned, Nahirim, is about inclusion. Right? Is it, 
is it logical for a, you know, a system uh, or a community to include within it people who want to destroy it? Maybe those are the people we don't want to include, right? So I want to have my cake and eat it too. I want full inclusion and full subversion at the same time. Sometimes I feel like the rules shouldn't apply to me. Other times I want to be treated equally. Sometimes an outsider, other times an insider, and I want to make all of these arguments in public. So here's one J. Michelson, uh, which is the J. Michelson of the book, right? And I'm not referring to myself in the third person. I'm referring to this mask. Sorry about that. I'm referring to this mask that I sometimes wear in public, right? There's one person who says, mainstream Western religion supports gay liberation. That is kind of the message of the book. Then there's another person who says, queer liminality uh, helps create a non-ethnocentric Jewishness or a non-ethnocentric religious, uh, religious consciousness. Um, and I'm not sure that those two can be squared with one another, but I continue to go on making both arguments in public. I do want to say that at the very least, it's not just a conundrum. So drawing from the resources of queer spirituality and from the notions of queers as liminal, and again, this is just one example of where this dichotomy, where this tension comes up, invites me to consider queerness as a serious and fascinating theological category rather than just a predicament. And that may be preaching to the choir to some of you, but I assure you that a mile from here, uh, in many houses of worship that are right around Vanderbilt, uh, this statement is, is not taken for granted. Right? That it is seen by progressives and by our allies and by our LGBTQ allies as a predicament and a predicament to work with. So I'm thankful for all of these um, contradictions and tensions because at least they remind me uh, that the gift of overlapping and intersectional identities is in fact a gift uh, and not um, a curse. Thank you. So yeah, we, have, we deliberately have a lot of time for questions, so I'm eager in conversations and rebuttals in that order, so the rebuttals go last. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more as we come to talking about it, um, about the way you're conceptualizing the word gender, mm -hmm. um, and particularly how, if you are grappling with the, the sort of the trickiness of that, right? The mm -hmm. not picking up on either non Western cultures or Western cultures being often sort of not well treated by non Western cultures. Right, so, by the bad guys, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think hopefully in my presentation of, of third gender gay spirituality, I was clear that there's a lot of problems uh, associated with it. Um, I think, um, you know, there's something right as you were speaking that I was like, that's the thing I want to bring out, and I haven't yet remembered it yet. But um, yeah, I think, I think the dynamic. I think the dynamic is of east-west or north-south, if you want to put it that way, um, is always there. And so for me, it's about being as self-conscious as possible. I know a lot of gay men who go to uh, events like the Naraya, which is sort of a, a pastiche of a Native American ceremony. They don't wear the clothes, but they do dance the dances. Um, for me, that crosses the line into a kind of kitsch that's also cultural appropriation that's problematic. But for them, it doesn't. And I think, you know, I know for a fact that their politics are kind of good and well-meaning. So while it is actually deeply problematic, I also, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily judging them for taking part in it. Um, I also think, and this is the second point, that like I said uh, earlier, just the notion that these traditions exist is so far out of, I think, where a lot of people are in the, in, you know, just in sort of common understand, common knowledge, that I'd love to just, like, if we could even just all get to the level of cultural appropriation and kitsch, I'd be thrilled, right? Like, halavai, we say in, uh, in sort of Yiddish, right? Like, we should only be so lucky, like, to be at the, at the, at the place where everybody's too much culturally appropriating, um, you know, formerly subjugated or continually sub subjugated uh, non-Western cultures. Like, we should be so lucky that that, that would happen. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's, um, I think historically, a lot of this work hasn't been done yet. There actually was just a book-length study of the gay spirituality movement called A Special Illumination that was just published that um, there's much more to be written is what I'll say. And uh, I think the intersection between the gay spirituality movement of the 1970s and the women's movement of the 1970s hasn't really been done yet. 
And I think seeing the former is in some ways a reaction to the latter or a Me Tooism to the latter uh, is actually could be really interesting and really fertile. Um, and I think it's it's a it is a new religious movement, you know, like others that it's not quite clear whether we're supposed to take it seriously yet or not. Um, I think that the most problematic piece for me of, uh, of third gender spirituality as I practice it is what's sometimes called feminism without women, right? So isn't it great that I, as a gay man, self-identified gay man, can, it can embody both the quote unquote masculine and the feminine? Because then I don't have to deal with you, assuming that you identify as female, which, right? So, right, so then, isn't that great? So I can, I can have the feminine all around me and the goddess, but no women, which, was, which just suits a lot of people just fine. So I think there's, there is something very problematic um, about taking on the role of the other um, and saying like, yep, I've got it. You know? And you see, one, you see it a lot actually with really like, pretty interesting you know, queer men actually who take on a lot of these kind of identities but I think are also, yeah, it's a little similar to the other kind of cultural appropriation except it might be a gender appropriation. Um, so hope, I, think, I think my message of this answer is clear about ambivalence, right? Uh, on the one hand, I see it as a really nourishing set of traditions. On the other hand, and new traditions. Um, on the other hand, you know, I mean, leave it to a few thousand men to get something wrong. So they, they, they have so far. Yeah. Oh, just in that. Okay. So yeah, let me just pull up this, uh, I'll do it to there, just so there's some nice words on there. Yeah, I mean, I had a actually really interesting night of, what was it, June 24th or whatever the night was at the, uh, so um, that night, it was the Friday night between, before New York Pride, and the Radical Fairies uh, do a thing called the Drag March every fri that Friday night to remember that Stonewall was a riot, that it was drag queens leading the riot, and that before it was a corporate-sponsored massive parade down Fifth Avenue, it was a very scrappy kind of grassroots event. So we all met in Tompkins Square Park. I dressed as a cheerleader from Glee, and um, we marched across. And so, and I mean, well, this is being recorded, but I'll just say it anyway. I mean, one of the one of the chants among many that were chanted was, "We don't want to marry; we just want to fuck." Right? And we're like walking across Manhattan, and and it ends at the Stonewall. It always has ended at the Stonewall. So we show up at the Stonewall right as the Senate is about to ratify same-sex marriage. <laughs> so. This then got reported in the news media. Many, like ABC News, reported the drag march as a pro-marriage march, right? Because it was like in support of marriage equality, right? And here they were on the night of marriage equality. So my partner and I, who were were in the drag march, um, took off our wigs, uh, went into the to the Stonewall to watch the Senate vote. And it was this remarkably schizophrenic moment where our anti, really anti-marriage friends were outside and our pro-marriage friends were inside. Um, and we were, you know, it was this great moment, which also made the news, uh, where they, you know, they played um, celebration, you know, when the vote was, uh, was announced. And um, it was this iconic moment in the sort of mainstream struggle for marriage equality at the same time as there were these people outside. So once again, the drag queens got uh, non-consensually recruited to a mainstream cause that they were never actually part of in the first place. Um, you know, I think... I'm less anti, I think I'm more ambivalent about marriage. I think my anti-marriage friends do actually see this as kind of a step back. One of the things that happened right after the decision was a bunch of uh, corporations and organizations that used to extend domestic partner benefits now don't extend them anymore. Now you have to get married, so it's kind of a compuls compulsory, you're either married or you're not. Um, but I think on the positive side, what happened in Massachusetts, if you kind of look after the few years, first few years of marriage equality, was actually there was this kind of large, mass group of people who had been organized, and they actually did turn their attention to other issues, whether it's LGBT youth homelessness or uh, access to housing and healthcare and so forth. So I think, personally, I am kind of a half my cake and eat it to kind of person by temperament, and I, I think there actually can be a lot of progress on the more radical agenda, uh, even by winning. I'm a liberal, not a radical, personally, so I actually kind of like incremental change. I'm fine with that. And, um, and uh, yeah, and I'm actually skeptical of radical change. So. Um, I think we can make progress toward a more progressive agenda even while going along on these different kinds of uh, stops along the way. Yeah. Um, thank you. I don't feel so crazy now. Yeah. Um, hearing you talk about being in both places.
places. And one of the things we, we, we talked about, and maybe you feel like you've said enough on, but I'd maybe love to hear you just say more on for myself, is that notion of, um, you know, does a community include those who in some way want to destroy? And the mistake I made was reading from Derrida for a paper, and I've been obsessed with Always a mistake, since. yeah. And his notion of that hospitality, and how, like how radical uh -huh. that gets, and how uh -huh. the stranger and that, that risk that's there at the threshold, and when we invite those people in, I, I, I wrestle with that, not being a Christian, but having been raised in the church and being in seminary where everyone around me is a pastor, um, and constantly talking about that notion, about mm -hmm. what does it mean to have people come in, and are we willing to let them kind of, you know, fuck with our faith, mm -hmm. kind of? I'd like to hear you say more about what you feel about or think about that. Yeah, I, I thanks for that. I, I think... Um, I. Uh, it's kind of a cop out. I think it's really complicated, but I think it, I think it is a really subtle and nuanced kind of thing. So you know where it's happening now, where I see it happening now, actually, is more around transgender inclusion in religious spaces. So it's like, oh well, yeah, of course we want to be fully inclu inclusive. What gender neutral bathroom? What? It's like, okay, I want to be inclusive, but I don't want to actually spend money or you know or have my own. So that even is easy because you can always just relatively easy spend the money and just get a single cell bathroom, right? But uh, but to actually have my own categories of male and female, masculine and feminine, like disrupted and questioned, like, wait, 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 I just wanted you to feel comfortable at services, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think th there's another analog uh, around feminist theology. I think in the Jewish uh, world, which is what the one I know best, there, you know, so it's like, oh, well, the, the rhetoric around women rabbis, for example, in the conservative movement, which is kind of the centrist movement um, in the American Jewish community, was very much a sort of, of course you should let us in kind of uh, equality-based rhetoric. Well, as soon as we got, they got in, right, however these categories are constructed, right, as soon as women became, so then there actually started being really productive questions being raised about other issues, like how do we make the liturgy gender neutral, or what are we doing when we're gendering God, or, you know, all these other things. So it's like inclusion didn't have no effect, right? And how lame, it would be really kind of sad if inclusion had no effect, right? So we're all included in something, and we don't change it at all. We have nothing, we as whoever we are, have nothing to add distinctively, right, about, and um, so I, I think, I, I think it's, I, I think it's a bit of false consciousness, frankly. I mean, I think for, for the true good gays, who may or may not exist in, except in fantasy, right, who really do, actually they do exist because I know some of them, they really just want to be members of the same country club as their straight rich friends do. That is really what they want. They are not interested in any kind of like, you know, revolution of any kind, right? They are interested in having the privileges that they want to have. And so for them to say, let us in and we won't make a difference is actually truthful. But for those of us who think that we actually have something to say that may be connected to whatever identity it is that's currently being marginalized, I think it's a bit of false consciousness to say, we're, oh, let us in and we're not going to change a thing. I hope we are going to change something, right? So I think it's tricky. But I, like, I, like I said in the conclusion, you know, I'm pretty good at making the inclusion uh, argument. You know, I, I'll bang on the door and, you know, break it down if I can. And, you know, and I'm good at having that conversation. Um, and I think in terms of the raw amount of suffering, that is actually the conversation that I want to have. Right? Um, but I think it's one that omits a certain amount of, um, of the productive power of being in a marginalized group that, that suddenly is not marginalized. And I guess let me just add one example of this. I think, it, I think the Dan Savage uh, interview in the New York Times, um, the New York Times Magazine, is a really interesting example of this, where Dan Savage, who's actually, re the, the article painted him out to be relatively conservative, which he actually is relatively, depending on what spectrum, you know. <laughs> um, but he, he made a couple of points about not 100% monogamy Around, uh, around his marriage and other gay marriages, mostly gay male marriages. And his actually, according to the article, is like almost perfect monogamy. It's like they've each had like three or four you know, uh, connections outside of, their, outside of the, the monogamous relationship. But that was enough for a lot of right-wing critics to seize on that thing and say, see, we told you that gay marriage was gonna destroy traditional marriage, and now gay marriage is leading to basically polyamory and open marriage, which we told you was gonna happen, you didn't listen, and now the big spokesperson for like letting letting the gays not kill themselves is actually uh, is actually supporting open marriages and 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 polyamory, and they're not entirely wrong about that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you could say 
more about the dichotomy that we uh, discussed about the centrist versus constructed identity. Because I'm remembering an article that you wrote in Religion Dispatch. Oh, geez. Where, <laughs> <laughs> um, Which day was that? <laughs> the argument that I'm remembering is actually something that would, um, is a point about how constructed understandings of queer identities contribute mm -hmm. to more mainstream notions of queer Hmm. Well, let me uh, let me just uh, jump jump and say what I'm going to say, and if I contradicted something I've written in an article, then so be it. Um, no, I think you know. I think uh, I, I think hopefully I argued the exact opposite, uh, which is that my my the way I generally see it is that the essentialism argument is the one that wins. Um, so. Uh, and it's difficult, Shara and I were talking about this earlier, like in, in, even in the book, I really do try to kind of finesse the question. So I sort of say, well, you know, for a lot of people, especially, right, so we now actually have pretty good data, you know, on sort of women's sexuality in particular being much more on a continuum than men's sexuality. So a lot of people, especially a lot of women, um, don't see things as, you know, don't see their sexuality as black and white, it changes over time, it, it, lots of different kinds of fluidity. And the way I try to finesse it in the book is actually, and this is like, yeah, the way I try to finesse it in the book is to say, well, even if that's true, it's not like a choice in the ordinary sense of the word choice, right? Like who you fall in love with is not a choice the way that like you decide if you're going to have vanilla or chocolate ice cream at the, at the Ben and Jerry's after this, right? So it's like, that, so even, so the rhetoric of choice is clearly insufficient even if we take a notion of some kind of fluidity of, of gender and sexuality. And I'm mostly talking about sexuality in this case. That's not exactly the same as constructivist and essentialist, fluid versus stable, but it's, it's going to be close enough. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to like pretend like that I'm totally just talking about Lady Gaga, but there was a really interesting interview. Like if you actually, so here's the queering of Lady Gaga, right? So I've kind of put her on the essentialist side. But actually, if you, re if you kind of read the lyrics or look at them closely, she's basically saying, I was born this way, meaning I was born to be kind of a freak, right? Or a monster, or myself, or individual, right? She's saying, so yeah, there are some categories that may be fixed, even though they're socially constructed, right? She goes through various like racial groupings. But she also like kind of talks about basically like, this is about me being who I am. And that's what I was, like I was born to be proud in a way, or I was born to be self-assertive. So not I was born to be, because actually, and I think her own sexuality is, is neither you know, black nor white, kind of you know, fixed in a category one or the other. So I don't think she's actually making the essentialist argument. I think it's just kind of, you know, but I, so I was, uh, just another anecdote on this, you know, I was, um, I was just on a trip to uh, India, actually, uh, like a tour. So my mother bought me a, a 40th birthday present and, and brought my, my partner and I on a trip of, to India, but it had to be my mother's trip to India, <laughs> meaning, you know, ritzy, very expensive, stay in five-star hotels. If anyone read, oh, what's the, the book that I'm not getting the name of? The one with the heart of darkness that takes place in the south of India. It's this, like, great book that everybody reads. Arundhati Roy, The God of Small Things. Right, so we stayed in the heart of darkness over and over and over again. Like it was, it was, it was colonialism 101. And so, okay, so we were the gay guys, right? It was a lot of, it was all straight couples in their 60s and 70s and us, basically. <laughs> and um, one guy who was, he was conservative. He, he took, said that he was kind of a moderate, but he was voting Republican most of the time. He's, but he's like, you know, I get it. I'm for gay rights. You were born this way. Like, pff, you, you know, like you can't help it. You can't help it. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, well, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a little more, you know, celebration of, of sexual diversity than that. But at the same time, like, that was, that, was the, that was the argument that did it for him, right? And so it kind of goes back to that question of whether, you know, where, where's, are, is it about fidelity to the truth or is it the use of the truth? Um, so I'm not willing to lie to make a, you know, to make some political point or get some political thing, but I will emphasize one, one argument over another one. Um, because people's lives actually are at stake. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I guess I want to test that because if you were right as the artist case, a certain argument would still be in certain lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, uh, a couple of moments that kind of always struck me in the presentation of the material, one being this, I don't know exactly how to share this, you know, share these together, and this weird kind of distinct um, vision or iteration of what rhetoric or strategy far as they actually are in tension and um, cancel each other in terms of possibility, mm -hmm. um, it, it seems that talking one's hands up is at least morally problematic. Mm 
Yeah, I definitely agree with that last sentence um, that you just said. I think I, I would push back on the closing being I. I mean, I actually think that was a deliberate querying of what it is to give a, a lecture of this type. You know, I'm, I just wasn't, I, I, and you know, I think, yeah, I mean, last year where there was an earlier version, this, it, none of that was in there. And I felt it was a bit of a cop out. You know, at the end, I was just kind of like, well, that's the problem, thanks. Um, so I actually wanted to just to do yeah, a, few, a few slides of where I'm at with it. So I, I, um, I'm going to stick with that. I mean, I feel like I, I, I definitely take your point, and I don't want my, I mean, to me, whenever I use the I language in this kind of a context, that's actually a way of saying exactly what I interpreted you just as saying, which is to say, this is, my, this is how I do it, um, not to prescribe it for anyone else. On, on your first point, on, the, you know, like on this particular set of dichotomies, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I do think I, I, I do think there's an extent to which, even though I try to be both and in the book and in my public kind of conversation about this, uh, I do think there is an extent to which it's either or, um, e meaning either uh, constructive choice, et cetera, fluidity, or you know, kind of born this way and so forth. Um, it's funny, I'll, I, you know, Andrew Sullivan in Virtually Normal uh, started, he did his I statements right at the beginning. And he said, uh, well, look, you know, I understand that many people experience their sexuality as fluid. I don't. And I know that there are other people who are, who are like me. And so I'm going to make this, these arguments for, you know, for that subset of people, recognizing that there may be a larger set of people for whom these arguments don't work. But I can, t if, even, he said, see, he has some line in there. I don't remember what it was. But, and so don't misquote my misquoting on this. But it was something like, you know, even if it's only a thousand people who experience their sexuality as entirely homosexual, it's worth it just for them, or something like that. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting point, but it does miss, I think, your point, which is by, by going in that direction, how many, what do we leave on the table? And then I think, it, you know, it really goes back to, uh, it, to me, it goes back to what's our objective. Uh, and if we're, if we're having a sort of political objective or some other, or let's say broader political objective, if we're having a narrow political objective of getting marriage rights for two women, um, and that's what we're about, um, you know, the essentialist argument's gonna be much more effective than the other one. Um, and so it's a, cho it's, it's a choice of what our goals are and what we're willing to sacrifice in order to achieve those goals. Um, whereas, again, if our goals are um, self-actualization for everybody, the last thing you would want to do is kind of make some sort of essentialist claim, which then shuts off whole avenues of self-actualization for lots and lots of people. By queer science, do you mean like gay, straight, and the reason why, and like like science stuff? Is that science. like science rhetoric science. about science. queerness? Yeah. Right. And, and, and science is science, um, scientific experiments are done. They're mm -hmm. measuring people's fingers because they're right. The finger the length and the hypothalamus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Or in this way, it doesn't mean good. Or in this way, it does not mean good necessarily in the Christian context. Right. And then, um, uh, I guess, finally, which is one evidence for why it really doesn't mean good, um, is um, just up the road in Louisville, um, the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who <laughs> hears about queer science so that they might find a biological cause for homosexuality, thinks that we can fix it by, you know, mothers wearing a patch on their belly. Right. Some genetic fix or some kind of, you know, some kind of fix like that. And, and so sticking with the nature of things, mm -hmm. sticking with one woman's right, does absolutely nothing to address that and, in fact, reinforces it. So it may get you more, it may get you something immediately, mm -hmm. but, it, but, it, but it also, I really do worry about its consequences for the long term, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, uh, and even for the, for the near term. Yeah, I'm, that's a, you know uh, that's an excellent point. I mean, I think I'll give first a little bit my, my view is on that, which is um, I actually think once we get in the door, uh, the larger debates are going to happen, mm -hmm. and I think once there's and it's and I, I just actually I actually am an optimist. I actually think we're going to win, and I think uh, we you being the forces of light is against the force of darkness. I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really do, and and so for that reason, mm -hmm. I tend to be very prag pragmatic meaning in the sense that I defined it earlier, about just like, just get me in there, right? Just get me on Ellen, you know, or whatever. Um, because once, uh, once we're on there in all our fabulosity, uh, the kind of deeper changes that we'd all like to see will actually happen. But they won't happen until, we're, until there's that basic floor level of legitimacy or reality. Um, so for that reason, I don't share what I took to be your view of like this could be dangerous down the road because I think the benefits of, of just being there are going to outweigh those costs. Um, you know, I, I think the only other point I wanted to make was uh, to not underestimate the size of those immediate benefits. Um, it's not just the 70-year-old guy on my trip to India. You know, when, when there have been polls done um, to whatever degree of reliability, that is the argument that wins. Uh, the you can't help it argument. And um, I, I think if we make a conscious choice to abandon that, we should be really clear about who and what we're abandoning. Um, I wouldn't argue yeah. for abandoning it, but I would argue for something for a much more complex way of talking about, I get much more like Lady Gaga than Christian mm. you know, I am Christian, I am born this way. That doesn't mean that, you know, necessarily, you know, like there's some genetic component to my being Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and to do that, you have to, in some way, kind of start with some some notion of well, there was already a potential story for that in me, right? Right. And and that and it, but but it still is a much more it's a, it's a little bit more complex. I mean, it's kind of the way that that um, that Leslie Leslie Sedgwick talks about this in the '70s. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I think. Not, not so much the ones who you know who just literally would say, yes, I'm choosing to have sex with women, but that but you know. Well, I think it's really, I mean, I think it's really helpful to remember the genderedness of that very discussion. Because yeah. um, I do actually think, I don't know about Kinsey, but I do buy some of the subsequent uh, data that, you know, men are much more likely to be one or six than women are, and women are much more likely to be three and four. And um, so even the conversation about, you know, what's fluid and what isn't fluid, that itself depends on, on the sort of gendered lens that you're using to, to look at it. Um, yeah, there was, you know, one other piece about the essentialism constructionism piece is also about time, right? So uh, I guess the best, the, the most voices for essentialism are pretty naive actually right now. I think the best one is actually Larry Kramer, 
um, who's come out swinging against all the queer theorists. He hates queer theory, Larry Kramer, right, author of The Normal Heart. Hates it, hates it, hates it. He says they're taking our history away from us. Um, and our history is the history of gay, gay and lesbian people uh, throughout you know, throughout all of recorded time. And so he loves to say, you know, uh, Socrates was gay, right? Now, you, you can't say Socrates was gay in an undergraduate queer, queer theory course, right? I mean, that's just absurd, right? But he, he really wants to go to the mat for that. Um, and I actually do think, I think we may have gone a little far to the other extreme on the constructionist side. And the language that I've chosen to use, again, in the book, is um, people we might today call L, G, B, or T, X, right? So like, was Queen, Queen Christina of Sweden uh, transgender and probably intersex? Yeah, right? Would she, he ever have identified in that way? Obviously not. Can we export in and, or import in any of her experience to then talk about transgender experience in 2011? No. Should we even use the word trans? No, right? But, and certainly, you know, how much more so using the words gay or lesbian? even for people who lived in Lesbos, right? So, right, so I do, so, but I do think that, I do wanna keep using that language that I'm using of people we would today call, because I think to me that captures something, that captures just enough essentialism for me to avoid the Larry Kramer charge and say something like, I do feel like there's some connection between my experience of sexuality and the way that the hero warrior love convention is explored in David and Jonathan. I mean, I'm saying David and Jonathan's lines at my wedding. So I obviously see some kind of resonance between my love for my partner and Jonathan's love for David. David didn't really love Jonathan that much. <laughs> I, just to full disclosure, there was a big bombshell that occurred over the use of the language of winning a couple of days ago and some questions of who are the we and what are we winning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You can never problematize too much. <laughs> I, I'd like to problematize that. But, 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 once, but, once, but, once, no, but once we get these things that even if you want to contest them, especially marriage equality, I think there is there is going to be this ability for a large part of you know, communities in the country to no longer have that necessity. Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, let me let me go to the we first because that's the easy one. Um, yeah, I mean, I ho hopefully, and this I'll maybe look right at the camera that when I use language like we and win, it's always ironic, uh, or at least somewhat, or at least tongue in cheek. Um, there are lots and lots of different we's, um, and uh, you know, I think the we language is always some of the most, to use your favorite word, problematic. Um, <laughs> You know who's assumed in the we and who's not in the we and and what who's who's and I mean the question you know the point earlier about like whose experience gets valued and whose doesn't you know that's the we so we are fighting for right to to marriage well that we just excluded a whole ton of people who you know whose self actualization uh, doesn't or won't in include something related to marriage and that also includes people for whom sexual orientation is not the issue but maybe gender identity is the issue. Um, you know, let's, I mean, the, the elephant in the room at, at any HRC event is always transgender issues, right? Because HRC had a spectacular blow up, right, <laughs> over, transgender, over, over transgender and over building that kind of a coalition, right? And I think it's widely understood, including within HRC, that they totally blew it. Like they blew it, 100% blew it. I think every, like, right, I think they understand this. Um, and they blew it partly, right, they, partly they blew it because they were stupid, because they, they should have known they were going to lose anyway, uh, that particular battle. But even aside from that, um, you know, it was the decision to say, well, the we that we're really going to fight for, we're actually going to throw you overboard because we think that this other we, 
which is the Wii that controls the board and so forth, we can get this thing that we want. And forget even the details and the substance of what it was. We can get this thing that we want. If you're here, so now you're not in the Wii, right? So now you're, we're going to get you out of the Wii, and then the Wii can get this thing. So it's, it's a very live uh, question. But I think, I mean, the reason I skipped over back to this slide was I, I think the Wii is in large part, when the, when the Wii is shifting in a constant coalition-y sort of way, the Wii is in large part defined by the goal. Um, so if sexual liberation, or what I was calling self-actualization, is the goal, then obviously queers should be uh, allies with anyone who identifies as poly, or at the entire BDSM community, or anyone for whom sexuality is an important part of their self-actualization, and that's limited by the bad guys, whoever the bad guys are. Right? On the other hand, if the we is, is defined by a goal of attaining certain kinds of equality, then the last thing that the HRCs of the world would want to do would be associate themselves with the BDSM community, right? I mean, <laughs> these are the same people who have been trying to get the leather daddies out of the pride parade, right? And I used to, actually, I mean, I'll just cop, I used to be that way. I remember about 10 years ago, I was just like, why are the drag queens in the pride parade? Are they <laughs> stupid? Like, don't they realize that they are feeding into, like, every anti-gay stereotype that like every bigot has like with these guys you know the drag queens and then the guys in the harnesses and the this and like what the hell are these people thinking right this is what i used to i really used to think and it, it took me actually a long like while to kind of be like okay like the we that's here in the pride parade is actually not one we right and we actually have very different goals in mind and actually what this is parade in its ideal form might celebrate is in fact that very diversity that there's like the very square you know gay 4-h people and the very not square you know um, whoever's not square I don't want to marginalize anyone by calling them not square right so like <laughs> right that ideally it's actually I, I think the pride parade is actually a meta parade it's a parade about a parade it's a parade of saying, this is what it would be like in a utopian kind of temporary, not so autonomous zone to create a community that didn't constitute itself by a single set of commonalities, right? Because really, what do I have in common with you know, this person over here who has a totally different experience, and da, 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 other than maybe we have a shared adversary or we're something about liberation or something about, about being ourselves. But in a certain way, what, when the pride parade works, it's precisely that, right, that meta parade about this is, what, this is what a big we could look like, that actually we're not really going to agree. And the person who's just like me 10 years ago, I mean, I have friends who are just like me 10 years ago who just wish that the SM people would just get out of the pride parade, right? Or just like, just go to Folsom, right? Or now Folsom East, right? Like, you have your own, notice the you, right? You have your own space. Go there, right? And that's, and that's fine, and, but don't come here, right? So people still have that, have that view. So I think the we is defined in large part by this goal and in large part also by the work that we each have to do, that each of us has to do. And with this all closed, because we're just about out of time, except for Patrick. Uh, the work that each of us has to do, which is actually what's exciting about this kind of journey, which is to say it, there's always the next frontier. Right? There's always the next, whatever that, wherever you are, you know, no matter how like whacked out and radical you may be, there is still that next piece for you. And I used to get exasperated by this. It felt like political correctness. Like, ugh, when can we just, okay, we've included everybody. Like, ha, by the way, here's a joke I'd like to never hear again. Well, how many letters are there in the acronym now? LGBTIQA, UBABC, PDQ. I am sick of that joke. I would like it not to be made. I think it's actually a really offensive anti-inclusion joke. Um, I hear it all the time, and I think it's I think it's outrageous. But that what that joke, if that joke were were queered a little, were turned in on itself, it actually could be a really kind of nice statement. You know, we will never have enough letters in the acronym, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's kind of nice, actually. I think that's really liberating. All right, Patrick's going to, Patrick and I will have the last word. <laughs> um, so, so just a question um, about uh, interface uh, reading of history and text. Because uh, I think one of the themes that we've had here is, is the fact that it's so Christocentric. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you was, it's one thing to read the big picture. Mm -hmm. How do you read Roman? I mean, and how do you square that, you know, sort of like, I wouldn't dare it's to eight fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's 8.50. <laughs>
Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, well, I do, first of all, uh, in the book at length. Right. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I largely do by just disclosing my position and moving on from there. You know, I'm reading it as somebody who's, who's encountering these texts, um, not as somebody for whom this is part of my faith tradition. Um, I think I read Leviticus actually in the same, with the same methodology that I read Romans and, and Corinthians. I don't think, I don't, I mean, I don't think that, a reader could point to the way I read Leviticus and say, well, you read that because you're Jewish and that's how you, it's different from how you read Romans. Um, you know, in both cases, there's the combination of micro, you know, what does the word, you know, the toeva mean? What does the word paraphesin mean? What is the word, you know, whatever, you know, and the combination of that with zooming back to what are the fundamental values that are animating this text and zooming back to what are the fundamental values that enable us to read the text in a liberating way. Like what are the choices that we make? So. I don't think that does away with the problem, but I, I think copying to it, um, you know, is, is, is at least a way of disclosing it. I think, you know, one thing that I don't do uh, in the book, which um, a lot of other folks have, you know, I mean, Noach's not here this, this year. Noach Zamora does a really good job of sort of seeing some of the queer of the multi-faith or of the interfaith itself. Um, I sort of wasn't interested in going there in this particular project, but I think there is something really interesting. I mean, I'm my, my, my uh, fiance is converted now to Judaism, so I don't get like the interfaith cred I used to have when he was <laughs> Unitarian. Um, but since each of us you know, practice multiple spiritual traditions and, and see ourselves as hyphenated religious beings, um, there is a little bit of that. And um, so I, I think that's another piece. But it, you know, again, back to that sort of, sort of some of the framing questions, the last thing I want to do or terrify uh, adherence, conservative, relatively conservative adherence of faith traditions that by liberating queers we're all going to be interfaith. Um, even if I think that's true, I, I'm not going to really sort of go down that line uh, it, in this kind of a project, in a mainstream sort of a project. Um, ultimately, I think that would be utopia if we would all go to that sort of a different kind of a matrix and still have our specificity but exist in not just multi-faith but multi-everything communities. Um, and th that sounds great to me. Uh, but I want to recognize that like on the axis, yeah, I'll close with this kind of metaphor and then that'll really be it. On the axis of wherever you want to be on that issue, I don't think that actually sexuality or, or liberated sexuality is determinative. And the main place I, I use that metaphor is actually around uh, quote unquote family values or sexual ethics, right? If you want to be a old school blue meme, uh, family values conservative. Um, you can do that with full liberation for you know same-sex couples to get married and and do and that. If you want to be fully liberated beyond any of those kinds of constraints and have a much more celebratory attitude toward eros, you can do that and have uh, the liberation of uh, sexual and gender minorities be part of your program. In other words, no matter where you want to be on this axis, uh, from uh, you know, Andrew Sullivan to Patrick, uh, right, uh, to Patrick Chang, um, no matter where you, <laughs> I've read the book and the articles. See, see, Patrick is smart, right? He puts the radical stuff in the articles in these journals, which who reads these journals? Me and like the people who are here, right? But then the book comes out and it's like so accessible. This is what I need to learn. To do. I need to find more obscure journals to put my like really radical ideas out there. All right. So wherever you want to put yourself on the find yourself on the spectrum, including a moving place on that spectrum, um, the, 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 the line of acceptance versus non-acceptance of sexual and gender minorities is not the dividing line that makes sense. Right? Some other line may or may not make sense, uh, but this one doesn't. And um, that ultimately is kind of the, the, the I'll just use the word cop out, to the, to the kind of questions of which, what needs to be decided and, and what doesn't in order to do any kind of public writing around sexuality. Uh, which is to say, hopefully, a kind of radical pluralism with regard to sexual ethics and an insistence that very different sexual ethical programs can still accommodate uh, the full acceptance and dignity for sexual and gender minorities. May it be so. Thank you so much. <laughs>